Alright, I've had a request to uh, do an example of how to analyze and sketch the graph of a polynomial. Uh, so this asks us to do that for this particular polynomial, x cubed plus 5x squared minus 73x minus 77. When we do this for polynomials, we need to include the intercepts and behavior. Any estimated maxima or minima, our book calls those turning points, so local maxes and local mins as we find them. Um, it, you'll notice that I listed this particular polynomial in standard form. So our first term is a cubic term. It's a third degree polynomial, cubic polynomial, and the coefficient here is 1. And then our constant term is last. It's negative 77. In standard form, looking at that, uh, our standard form gives us an idea of the end behavior. For very large x values, this thing looks like the x cubed graph for very negative numbers, uh, as x goes to negative infinity, the function value, this starts to dominate, and this goes to negative infinity. And likewise, for large x values, as x goes to the right, as x goes to infinity, the function value, this term is called the dominant term, uh, it goes to infinity as well. So this is what our end behavior is going to look like. And really, the big question now is in, in the middle, uh, because this is an odd function and its, its uh, range is all the real numbers, it, it, it's a polynomial, it's continuous and smooth, so it definitely crosses the x-axis once, but maybe it crosses three times, or maybe it crosses twice, it crosses once and kisses, you know, or maybe it crosses once up there. That's really what we're looking for right now, is looking for any zeros, and then we'll definitely want to check those uh, maximum and minimum once we find the zeros. This is in standard form, and the form that we want for the zeros is factored form. So at this point, we want to look to see if we can factor the polynomial. Uh, one of the theorems that's useful in doing this is the rational zeros theorem, or the rational roots theorem. And what that tells us is if we take the leading coefficient, if we call that q, the leading coefficient q is 1, and our um, constant term, p, is negative 77. What the rational roots theorem tells us is that any rational zeros, any places where this function crosses the x-axis, uh, assuming that all of our coefficients are integers, which they are, must be of the form factors of p factors of q. They're in this ratio form. That's why we call them rational roots. The factors of q in this case, factors of q, are just plus or minus 1. And then the factors of p are, there aren't many of them, plus or minus 1, plus or minus uh, 7, plus or minus 11, and plus or minus 77. Uh, so the list of all possible factors of the form, factors of p over factors of q, I'm just dividing each of these by plus or minus 1, so they just it's that list again. It's plus or minus 1, plus or minus 7, plus or minus 11, plus or minus 77. This is the list of possible, possible rational zeros. Now, rather than just blind guessing and seeing which of those are zeros, it's useful at this point to have our calculator, now that we've got some ideas here, to help us get an idea and be a smart guesser. Because remember that the uh, these zeros, when we're factoring, and, um, and the rational zeros, these are related um, on the graph where it's crossing the x-axis. So we can look and see on our graph, if we can plot it, where this graph crosses the x-axis. So if we put our polynomial x cubed, and make sure you arrow out of the exponent to uh, get 5x. And if you use the squared button as opposed to this, you don't have to arrow out of the exponent. Minus 73x minus 77. Okay. We put our uh, polynomial in there, and when we hit the graph, uh, we know the general shape, and that does not look like the general shape. We're zoomed in too far. But we do see, I mean, assuming the graph comes up, goes down, and goes back up, it looks like it might be crossing at 1, at x equals negative 1, sorry. And it also looks like it may be crossing at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay? So those are the, those are the two places. So maybe negative 1 
and positive 7 are possible rational zeros based on looking at the graph. But I want to get the better view of the graph in the graph viewing window. We're zoomed in too far. And we need more of our x-axis to see what the overall shape looks like in total. So we're going to extend out the x-axis. We'll go from negative 20 to 20. And we'll go by tens just to see those. Now our y-axis, again, we didn't see where those maxima or min are. So let's, let's zoom out to 100 above and below the uh, x-axis by tens and see what that looks like. Now we can see where the graph comes up, crosses the x-axis at a little more than 10, maybe negative 11. So maybe negative 11 is another 0. I still can't see this maximum or this minimum, but I get a sense of where it's happening. If this is up at 100, maybe I need to zoom out to positive or negative 300 above the y-axis. I need to uh, compress my y-axis so that I can see those better. So let's change our viewing window. The x-axis should be fine. Let's go from negative 300 to 300. And we'll mark our axis by hundreds just for clarity. And now when we see, we still don't quite see this max here, but we can see this minimum. We see the three places it crosses the axis. So if we add another 100 up to the top, we'll have a picture of this graph on our calculator, and then we can do the same thing on our paper. So let's, let's just fix our axis so that we're looking at the same thing. Make this say 400. All right, so we know now that our graph does have that nice S shape, and so it comes up, and we know our end behavior. We know that it crosses something like this. If this is negative, we're, we're thinking maybe negative 1 here, maybe. Um, and we do know that it crosses at negative 77 at um, at when x equals 0, y equals negative 77, so that's our y-intercept. We could even write that here, right? The y-intercept, um, that means x equals 0, the y-intercept is negative 77. All right. Now, looking at our graph, we want to check and see if maybe negative 1 is a 0. So um, if I think that C is a uh, if C is a root or a 0 of the polynomial then the remainder when we do synthetic division will be 0 by the remainder theorem. Okay, so I want to use if C equals negative 1, the factor that's associated with it is X minus C. So X minus C, the factor that would be associated with a 0 of negative 1 would be X minus negative 1, which is X plus 1. So we're going to check and see if X plus 1 is a factor, if negative 1 is a 0. So we use the root, the zero, for synthetic division. If we were doing long division, we would use this factor. And we're going to divide that into the coefficients using synthetic division of our polynomial. Uh, the first one is 1, the second one is 5, the third one is negative 73, and the fourth one is negative 77. Note that if you were missing any here, you would need to include zeros to keep your spacing right. Uh, keep track of which terms. Synthetic division has the nice thing if you're not, you don't have to keep switching, you don't have to multiply, divide, add, and subtract all in one thing. The nice thing about synthetic division is just multiply and add. So we bring down the 1. At this point we multiply. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. And add. 5 plus negative 1 is 4. Multiply. Negative 1 times negative 4 uh, times 4 is negative 4, and add. Negative 73 plus negative 4 is negative 77. The opposite of negative 77 is 7 because we're multiplying. And then we add and 0. So indeed, we can see that negative 1 is a 0, or f of negative 1 is 0. And we could also have done that by plugging in. right? Negative 1 cubed is negative 1 plus 5 becomes positive 4. Negative 1 times this is uh, 70, positive 73 plus 4 is 77. 77 minus 77 is indeed 0. Okay, But what's, what we can do now, this thing here is the residual. We can note 
that are, we could rewrite our polynomial at this point and say, given that this is a factor, we can now say that our original polynomial f of x, we can write it in a partially factored form. x plus 1 times x plus 4, uh, sorry, x squared plus 4x minus 77. And you notice that this residual, this is a linear binomial term. This is a quadratic trinomial. This trinomial we can factor. We've got lots of tools for factoring quadratic equations. We could use the quadratic formula. We could use the AC method. Um, we could uh, use a lot of, we can also use synthetic division here using the, the tools here from chapter 5. But what we're going to do right here is I'm going to factor by grouping using the AC method real quick just to give you a sense of this. Um, if if I'm looking for factoring by grouping, I want factors of negative 7, 1 times negative 7, that add up to 4. And that looks like positive 11 and negative uh, 7. And so I split my middle term, plus 11x, minus 7x, minus 77. Okay, just bring that down. And then I factor each of these by factoring out the greatest common factor of the first two and then the second two. So I factor out an x here, that's x plus 11. And then here I factor out the negative 7. x plus 11 is left again. And finally I factor out the x plus 11 and I'm left with the factored form, x plus 1, x minus 7, and x plus 11. This is the factored form. If this is standard form, factored form is nice because I can find my zeros, right? The zero associate, this is zero when x equals negative one gives me a, a zero there. x minus seven or, right, the zeros, my zeros x equals 7, right, and then x plus 11, x equals negative 11, all right. So right here I can actually label at negative 11, that is indeed a 0. Here on the x-axis, when x equals 7, my polynomial is 0, and this is fully factored. And now, uh, looking at that, I've labeled my y-intercept, which is negative 77, or the point 0 comma negative 77. I've labeled my x-intercepts negative 11, 0, negative 1, 0, and 7, 0. I just labeled them on the axes. And so the last thing to do is to estimate and find my maxima and minima. I've got my end behavior. Remember, it's optional. You can just leave it like this or you can put the arrows on it like we used to do back in the day. Uh, the key thing you don't want to do is you don't want to use a closed or open circle on the end because that would indicate that you've stopped, um, you've restricted the domain and that you've stopped calculating going beyond that. This function will continue. It's, it's valid. It's a polynomial. It's, its domain is all real numbers. So uh, you just, again, just you can either leave the ends off or you can put the arrows on there to show the end behavior. And so now we are going to use our calculator to estimate the maxima and minima. Until you get in calculus class, you're not going to be able to take a derivative and set it equal to zero to find those maxima and minima. So we use our calculator to estimate it. Um, and at this point, we just go, we'll do the maximum over here first. So we're going to go second calculate a maximum, which is number four. All right, we need a point to the left of our max and certainly negative 10 is there. Make sure you're using the small minus sign down here. Uh, negative 10 and a point to the right of that certainly 0 is to the right and again we'll type negative 5 will be our guess and our calculator says that that maximum occurs there is a maximum at x equals negative this is when or where the maximum occurs um, is negative 6.87. The, the relative max value is, so f of negative 
is about equal to uh, 336.25. Um, now, I could leave it like this, or I could label it right here. So when x equals negative 6.87, I have a function max value comma of about 336.25 there, and I could even label it here, right? 336.25 there. And we're going to do the same thing for our relative minimum. We just need to go second calculate a minimum, uh, something to the left of it, and zero should work for that, something to the right of that, which would be 10, and again we can guess 5. And it tells us that when there is a minimum at x equals, or when x equals 3.54, and the relative minimum value of the function, the function value, the relative minimum value when it gets there, f of negative 3.54 is going to be about equal to negative 228.40. I should put about equal to there. That's not exact. Negative uh, 228.40. And again, on my graph, this is negative 228.40. That gives us this point right here, which is the point, again, you could mark them here, uh, 3.54 comma negative 228. Point four zero, and that completes our sketch. Um, shows it on the calculator, shows it on the paper. I've got my points and axes labeled reasonably well, as well as having the information here. Note the correspondence between factored form and the zeros, and between uh, our intercept and end behavior from, again, from the uh, standard form. Those are both the the two primary and most useful forms for polynomials.